But then so in like Crimson Peak, I'm just like, okay, it's pretty. It's really pretty, but I don't really enjoy it. You didn't like Crimson Peak? I didn't. I didn't. It's one of the few Del Toro movies that I just did not like. I didn't revisit. I was like, I'm good. Once is enough. Thanks. Ouch. I'm, I kind of like, <laughs> I viewed it as like a uh, gothic romance movie. And it is. And that's also, he achieved what he was going for. It's, I think that's the thing is I've never been a big period piece fan, period. <laughs> no, that's so it's, like, it's like watching Pride and Prejudice with ghosts. Like, I'm like okay, <laughs> cool. Not for me, but all right. It was his take on Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> yeah, and that's awesome. Like, good for him for not just doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, I... uh I think the thing that stuck out with me the most in that movie was like the contrast with the blood and the snow. Mm-hmm. Which that again, visionary, beautiful visionary, like that yeah. thought of doing like white and then dark, beautiful red colors. Like that's awesome. But I mean, that was Tim Burton's problem for me. It's like something like big fish, right? Like you're almost taking most of the vision away, but the characters are so good and so rich and, you just put that little twinge of Tim Burton in this in there. And it's like, oh, this is, this is your forte. This is perfect. Like, and then he decides, oh, now I'm going to do Planet of the Apes. And well, that happened. And ever since then, he's just kind of gone downhill. <laughs> well, I mean, I love Sweeney Todd, but I love Sweeney Todd regardless. I love the play. I love the movie. I love the story. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Did you watch Alice in Wonderland? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I watched the first one. I didn't, I still haven't seen the second one. Or, or Dumbo. <laughs> I haven't done Dumbo yet. I couldn't. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's so hard. Cause it's like Nightmare Before Christmas was a transformative movie for me, even though like he didn't direct it, like Harry Selleck directed it, but. Like, that was the most Tim Burton-y of Tim Burton things. And, like, the original book is amazing. And, and then it's just, like, you watch as he progresses. And it's like, can we go back to that? Can we go back to just characters and just that pure joy? I don't know. I mean, it's like anything. The older we get, the more we change. And the harder it is to hang on to those. But you also don't want people to just repeat themselves over and over. It's like a band where it's like, cool. Like I love this album. And then I got it 19 more times. It's good, but it's just the same thing over and over. Who, who do you think's notorious for being super repetitive in music or movies? Both. Let's do both. Oh man. <sighs> movies, you know, I think Michael Bay can get pretty repetitive. Like everything, if you really dissect a Michael Bay film, they're all just kind of the exact same, but there's nothing wrong with that to me. Cause it's kind of that comfort food of like, Oh, I'm walking into bad boys 93, but I'm going <laughs> to get this, the low, slow pull around shot. I'm going to get these like, way over the top explosions. I'm going to get just insane action. And it's like, okay, that's what I need. That's great. That's great. Music. Uh, I don't know. That's tough. You two, you two never really branched out from their U2 ness to me, but I'm also not like a a big, yeah. I'm like, I'm not a big enough U2 fan to really be like (laughs) definitively like I've listened to every track U2 has ever produced. And I don't know. I mean, that's the thing is like, I, I grew up in the punk rock culture where it's like, most people would be like, wait, this is a different band. It's like, yeah, this is a completely different band. Oh, they all just sound the exact same tune. It's like, I can you kind of see that. Have you been to a, is it Ronch's record shop? Is that what mm-hmm. the name is? 
Yeah. We we were in there um, a few years ago, me and my dad and my mom, and she does not like that music at all. <laughs> and on like, it was just blaring through the speakers and I, this guy was just aggressively yelling and he's like, yeah, yeah, fuck, <laughs> fuck, you know? And like every word that you could understand is like the like most vulgar word you could think of. And she's like, what is this trash? And my dad's like, this is punk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's so true. I mean, that, that's like one of my favorite movies was Green Room. And it's like the band in Green Room is awful. Like they're one of the worst <laughs> bands ever. It's just like they talk about how it's, it's not about the music. It's about the energy. And it's like it really is. Like you don't go to a punk rock show and just stand there and just like bob your head. It's just it's getting in there and just having fun and just feeling that energy and just that whole crowd just feeling this thing as a collective yeah the green room was fun <sighs> green room was so good that was a so that's a brutal good. movie oh and that was that's one of those movies where i'm just like how did this get financed how did it get made how did you get patrick stewart to take this like huge risk of a role <laughs> <laughs> oh man have you seen is, who directed that jeremy jeremy Sonier. Yeah, have you seen his uh, other film? Yeah, yeah, I've seen all of his movies now. I like them. I think he's a really yeah. his his movies are very um in your face sort of oh, with yeah. like the brutality of life, but like, it's not like over the top, like overused, you know. Well, and that that's what I kind of love and hate about his movies is it's like the violence is handled in such a realistic way, and it's like <laughs> this isn't fun. This is just violent. It's like. Oh yeah, because violence is violent, and it's it's like when you see somebody get punched in the face in real life, and like you're expecting that movie like sound, and all you hear is this like dull thud. It's like, oh, that hurt. That's, that's a <laughs> lot more painful. Yeah, real life remember, violent is not fun. I, I remember I was watching Blue Ruin, and there's the part where the uh, person gets shot in the head mm-hmm. while choking the guy, and like all he hears is like a sound. And he like lifts his head up. And you just see like his whole jaw like get shot oh, yeah. right off, like out of nowhere. It's like, oh, oh, okay, we're we're into some action now. Well, I've always thought it would be really interesting to start a movie like that, where it's like you start with violence, you start with all the like over the top insane violence, but then instead of following your like you know quote unquote heroes, you follow the devastation that is left in the wake of these real life people getting killed, and it's like. Oh, this guy was a father and a, a husband, and now his whole family is destroyed because of this act. It's like, but we're glorifying the killers. Oh, dude. Oh, okay, have you? Do you have a PS4? Yeah. Have you played the new Last of Us game? Not yet. I still haven't even finished the first Last of Us game. Oh, the, I'm, okay, like I'm halfway through. The what? What you just uh, kind of laid out, though, is kind of the groundwork of that game. It's really brilliant in that sense yeah i've I've watched a bunch of reviews that have said that where they're just like yeah like there's like quote-unquote bad guys but they're really way too human and you feel really (laughs) bad about killing them and it's like you know that's probably good yeah and like it doesn't really take effect until like halfway through the game you're just like oh shit i can't believe i did this earlier what and dude there's like some parts where like they have dogs sniffing you out and they expect it. Like, you can either sneak around or you can, you know, go full on waste your ammo and go on a shooting spree and try to survive. And it got so much to the point where like the dogs kept finding me and like, I'm just like, I, I can't do this. So like I had to, you know, <laughs> do what I had to do in this game to survive. And like, I felt so bad, but I'm like, fine, whatever, quick and easy, you know, like realistically, that's what would, be the case i assume yeah. being that situation and you know one this one dog found me out of nowhere and like i tried quick and easy and it didn't work and it became like one of the most gruesome kills and i'm like oh <laughs> fuck and like i had to call my sister and her boyfriend to like I have you guys got this a pixelated <laughs> animated dog yeah i'm like i'm like have you guys got this part and they're like no and i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> And I'm like, and when you kill somebody, they're like, oh my God, they killed Amelia. And you're like, you gave him a name? What? Right. Like, 
Oh, I, I had a roommate once that we, we had a mouse get into our apartment and was living on our couch. We're like, well, we have to get rid of this mouse. And I was like, I'm going to name him Jeremy. And they're like, don't name it. I'm like, Jeremy, I'm going to leave some cheese for you. And they're like, you're, you're going to make us kill something named Jeremy? I'm like, we don't have to kill Jeremy. He can just live with us. He can be our new roommate. They, right? they didn't find that as amusing as I did. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, cool, dude. Well, let's have you introduce yourself then. Okay. What would you like me to introduce myself as? However you want to be introduced <laughs> as. Uh, my name is Taylor Deuce. I just go by Deuce to 99.9% of the world. Pretty much my family is the only one that calls me Taylor. and <sighs> It's a thing. Before Taylor Swift became a person, like Taylor was not such a masculine feminine type name and <laughs> growing up that was always the worst is because people like teachers would be calling role they'd be like taylor and there would be a girl that would raise her hand and they'd be like taylor and then i'd raise my hand and it's like my parents gave me a girl's name but yeah i mean as soon as like junior high hit it was one of those where it's like you kind of become a last name because of gym class and for years, it was like, I didn't want to just be Deuce. I'm like, my parents made me something for a reason. I'm Taylor. <laughs> and then people would be like, oh, your last name is Deuce? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, I'm just going to call you Deuce. And I'm like, okay. And then just kind of over time, it, it was one of those, the more I realized like, oh, you are a Deuce. Like, you look in the mirror, you don't see someone named Taylor. You see someone named Deuce. So, Deuce. Oh, Deuce. <laughs> <laughs> that's how everybody calls you in the the utah film culture is yeah. deuce yeah. like when you mention deuce they're like oh i know that guy <laughs> and they go what an asshole glad he's gone yeah fuck that guy <laughs> <laughs> well that's cool uh, man um how yeah. so you before i started recording we were kind of talking about california because that's mm -hmm. where you ditched us to go live <laughs> ditched you <laughs> Dude, seriously, like, you announced that you were moving on, like, this one last night of shooting. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm moving. And everybody there was like, wait, what? And you're like, yeah, this is, like, a last hoorah. <laughs> and we're like, what? Like, you can't move? Like, we, we have all these projects to work on with each other. <laughs> but how, how's that treating you? You know, it was one of those, like, I never honestly had any desire to move to L.A. I just, I always knew that it was going to be little fish in a big pond and i think it was probably one of the most terrifying places for me like wanting to be a filmmaker my whole life you know that eventually like if you really want to make it you're gonna have to go to la or figure out something else and try and do it your own way but yeah my wife julie came to me one day and was just like you know what's keeping us in utah like why not just go to LA, see what happens. Worst case scenario, we just hate it and go somewhere else or come back to Utah. Like, cause you know, honestly, the worst thing in the world is you're going to just not enjoy it. Like, right. Failure is always an option, but failure to me has always been a learning experience and an opportunity to go, okay, well that didn't work. Let's find out why and try something else and see what happens. So, yeah, we came out here in the end of November, and so we were here for a couple months, got to, like, explore the city, have a lot of fun, meet a bunch of cool new people, and then stay in our apartment for a next however long that we get to stay in our apartment for, so. <laughs> but, are yeah, are it's, you... It's been... Oh, go ahead. Oh, is this, are you, like, in the heart of L.A., or are you in the outskirts? Uh, we're in North Hollywood, so we're... It's funny because when you say North Hollywood, people think it's like the north part of Hollywood, but it's not whatsoever. <laughs> it's more of like South Burbank. So from the heart of like downtown is about half an hour from us. Uh, to get to like Hollywood, Hollywood is about 15 minutes. To get to Burbank's about 15 minutes. So we're kind of in this like nice area without being in the heart of all the insanity and grossness how how are the uh riots treating you guys you know where we are we haven't seen anything like 
it's it's been hard because like Julie's work got shut down because she was working right on Sunset Boulevard and the riots were happening like right in front of the store she was working. So that's been kind of a bummer, but yeah, it's been fascinating to watch on the outskirts of things. But yeah, it hasn't affected us directly yet. So what's the cultural difference there compared to Utah? You know, it's it's diversity for sure like there's just a world of people that are not the exact same as you and the exact same cookie cutter blonde people so it's it's we've met so many people from so many walks of life and because it's LA nobody's actually from LA so it's like we've got friends from all over the world now and it's just such an interesting place because it's just different like everybody's different like Everybody has stories of different countries and different parts of the world and different like parts of the state. And it's just fascinating because everybody, I mean, you know me, I've been a storyteller forever and I'm always interested to hear like where people come from. And like one of Julie's best friends now is from South Korea. And it's just like hearing all of what it's like to grow up in South Korea is such a trip because it's so incredibly different. That's so cool, but, though. Yeah, it's, it's been amazing. Like, we love it here so much. Yeah, I was planning on coming down for, uh, not, not to see you guys specifically, but it'd oh, be sure. on the stop. <laughs> but, because uh, I've never been to LA in my life. So I thought it'd be kind of like a fun little vacation. Yeah, to yeah. To make a trip to California, but then COVID hit. So, yeah. That's Puts not a happening bit of a anytime soon. On <laughs> Seriously. Like, and, like, with my job, I have so much vacation to use and I'm like, oh, nice. what am I going to do? Like use it while I'm stuck at home <laughs> right? <laughs> just to sit on my couch. Like that's not vacation. That's just a weekend. <laughs> well, you know, and that's like so many things. It's like, you know, if you've got all this time built up, like why not see something new? Why not just yeah. jump in the car and go somewhere you've never been before and experience something that's not your apartment. Yeah, that's my that's my plan eventually. So, sorry. I'm glad you will cut out a little bit of time for me. Yeah, dude. <laughs> it would be fun. It would be so fun to go down there, and uh, I don't know. I, then I'm like, would I take my car? Or would I fly? I'm like, fuck, dude. I take my car. Like, yeah. I would. Why not? Like, the only thing that's stopping me is I have a bearded dragon, so I have to find somebody to take care of him for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. Being, being a pet owner, I know that feeling where it's like, all right, let's like go. So, Oh, we've got the dog. Okay. What do we do with the dog? Yeah. You're like, um, okay. And it's not like, it's like this, like with the lizard, it's not like I could drop him off because like his tank's 75 gallons. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to drop that off unless I'm going out town for like throwing a leash on him and just being like here. Yeah. <laughs> Walking so like, twice a day. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'd probably have to have, like, family stay here under the roof for a couple for of days sure. or whatever. I'm like, whatever. For sure. But not much to figure out now since we're in quarantine. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's quarantine. Everybody's been like, oh, it's so awful. It's so bad. And I'm like, but, you know, it's usable. Like, yeah. use this. Use your experience. Use this time that you're not being forced to worry about other things. And, you know, focus and increase creativity like why not yeah no totally i've been writing a lot more have you been writing yeah. more you've been editing as I've, I've seen i've been editing i've been writing i've been thinking i've been meditating i've been doing been, a lot of things you've been deucing it up i've been deucing <laughs> <laughs> no it's been really cool like i've been i've been writing a lot like not like I normally would. Julie and I actually started a project where for a week we just like every day we decided to write something together because she just got on this writing kick out of nowhere. And she bought me this book years ago that's like story prompts. So it's like the first uh, sentence and it's just finish the story. So this, this sentence opens with like, you know, Lisa told me to go back, grab a bag of ice from the store. And that was it. And from that, we started, like, she would write a part of the story, and then I would read what she wrote, and then I'd write the next part of the story. 
and we did this back and forth and it turned into this weird romantic comedy that turned out to be like 87 pages of narrative and i'm like i haven't written narrative like non-screenplay format in a million years so that was weird oh so it was like it was like not screenplay at all so it was like a short form like short story Prose. Yeah, yeah, it was just like oh my god, prose like, and it was <laughs> so weird because that's so not the mindset I'm normally yeah. in when I'm writing. But it was such a good exercise to be like, oh, like this gives me I could do a lot more internal monologue with these characters. <laughs> it was just fascinating, and so it's like then I go back to writing a screenplay, and it's kind of changing the way I'm viewing the screenplay process. So yeah, I uh, I always struggle writing short form because screenplay it's always present tense yeah and so i forgot how to use past tense in a proper way <laughs> right and then like i'll get all the tenses mixed up which is weird because people are like oh you're a writer you shouldn't get tenses mixed up i'm like i'm not like this this is normal right then it's like mm-hmm. no and then uh so i wrote a piece on medium a couple weeks ago it was like all past tense and i had to use grammarly to <laughs> go through right. it and correct where I screwed up and I screwed up like quite a bit. And I'm like, Oh yeah, dude, like writing screenplays have fucked me over. <laughs> right. Oh, I think the same way. I'm just like, the hardest part for me is like remembering to put like, he said, she said, <laughs> yeah. he, and I'm like, Oh yeah, that's a thing you have to do. It's not just the character's name and then what they're saying. That's fun though, dude. Oh yeah. No, we had a blast with it. And so like, and it's one of those where it's, it's, I've been reading a lot more, which is helping me write more. And yeah, yeah it's just craziness though. I've been, I've been reading this book. Oh, that looks fun. It's really, uh, I don't know. It's really in depth. I've been reading it though, uh, to help Landon out and all that stuff. So it's, yeah. it's been quite a trip. For sure. Well, you know, it, it, I'm one of those people that I've been a lifelong learner, and I, I'm one of those weirdos that really loved school, like just because I love learning. Yeah. And so it's stuff like that where it's like, oh, there's a book of information here that I could just learn something. And that's the thing is like having the internet now, like when I was a kid and first starting out, like thinking about filmmaking, like if I had the internet as a tool, like, good Lord, being able to go on YouTube and just Google how to light things, <laughs> how to do a three-point lighting setup, how to format screenplays, how to do a million things. Like, the first screenplay I wrote, I think I was, like, probably eight or nine, and I wrote a really terrible horror movie screenplay. But it was, like, it was on a typewriter. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sure the formatting was so incredibly awful, but you know, I went to like a bookstore and I found a book that was a screen adaptation of something. I don't even remember some screenplay, but I was just like, Oh, this is what a screenplay looks like. Okay. I'll just try and copy this onto my typewriter. <laughs> like tab, tab, tab. Yeah, it looks about right. <laughs> The, to use a typewriter is on my bucket list. I have never laid fingers on one. Yeah, it's there's there's a real discipline to a typewriter because it's not as easy as just press backspace and like it's all just deleted and like cool. It's like oh I I messed up here. I have to retype this entire page. <laughs> like oh this sentence doesn't work. I have to retype this entire page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it, it makes it, you think things through more clearly, I guess. Oh yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's like editing old school celluloid where it's like, like you can't just make a cut and then go, oh, this didn't work. Control Z. It's like, <laughs> no, this cut is this cut. That's it. There's no going back, buddy. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I, okay. So what, what makes your passion so meaningful to you? Oh man, what makes passion meaningful to me? Like, is in like for storytelling and filmmaking and storytelling, filmmaking? Because, um, I mean, because you, I, I view you more as a director because that's how I've met you. Yeah, just, yeah. Um, but through all, all of our conversations <clears throat> we've had, like, you've always brought up story and characters, and like, you know, like, I guess to to your core, like, it, it's a storyteller regardless of what medium well, you for use. Sure. So, just well, however you want to utilize it. 
I guess, like what, what makes telling stories like your thing, you know? So I grew up, I was an only child, so I didn't have any siblings or anything. And I grew up non-Mormon in Utah. So I actually grew up in a time where like my parents told me about how kids' parents wouldn't let them play with me because we weren't Mormon. And so I kind of had a lonely childhood. Like it wasn't a bad childhood, but it was kind of lonely because I didn't have those built in friends and built in babysitters. And my parents were working like, you know, I came from a very middle class background. And so from an early age too, I had insomnia, like crazy insomnia. Like my parents would always tell me that as a baby, it was like, we have to go to work tomorrow and you just don't sleep. So they would just put on movies for me. Like, I was like, I think my parents bought one of the first VCRs solely because it was like, oh, there's something that'll entertain him while we sleep. Cool. Great. Whatever, whatever we have to do. So I grew up with books and movies and television and all these things as kind of a guide and a roadmap to. I don't know if it's like the right word. It would be like to emotion or to empathy, but it was like, these became my friends. Like these characters became realer to me than the people around me because the people around me just weren't as interesting, like, frankly. So to me, storytelling, I, I think it's for me, the greatest gift I could give someone would be to give a kid that feeling and give them that that sense of place and of purpose and help guide them and, and give them a little bit of comfort and kind of, kind of always reaching back at the younger me and being like, here's something that would make you happy. It's going to make you look at the world in a different way. It's going to make you empathic to people that aren't like you. You know, I think that's problem is that when we're surrounded solely by people that are just like us, we don't get that broader view of, that everybody's story is interesting and everybody's story is worth telling. And, you know, that's the thing is like books, books have always been big for me because they can take you anywhere. They can take you to a desert Island. They can take you into outer space and you're using your imagination to take you there. The thing is, is that with a book, you have to devote so much time to really being in that world, which is awesome. Like it's like a video game. If you want to devote the 20, 30 hours into being in this world, it's awesome. But like, if you can do that same thing in a two hour movie and like kind of show people, it's like, to me, it was always, it was also relating to people that weren't around me. Like I grew up loving horror movies because my mom would always be like, oh, I want to see Halloween. I've never seen it, but it might be too scary for me. So she'd be like, here, you watch it first. Tell me if it's too scary. And then if it's not, we'll watch it together. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. And so, you know, I grew up not knowing people that liked horror, but through it, it was, there was always horror movies. So I was like, oh, all these characters I can relate to in different ways. And so I guess, yeah, my passion's always driven just by kind of trying to give my younger self something to entertain him and show him like, you know, the world's a scary place and it's full of different ideas and different people. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, there's stories, man. Stories are so much fun. They can do anything. They can make you feel good or bad or scared or comforted. And, oh, stories. And I don't know. I get rambly about this stuff. So <laughs> if we get too off topic, just tell me to shut up. No, dude, I love it. This is great. It was so because you mentioned Halloween. Was that the like the movie that kind of got you into looking at filmmaking as a way to tell stories? Or, uh, you know, it wasn't because my dad actually has worked in the industry off and on since before I was born. Oh, I he worked know in that. a <laughs> yeah. He did costume makeup on movies and TV shows and commercials and stuff occasionally, just because like he would have friends that were directors and DPs and like in the industry and they would just be like, Hey, we don't have anybody else to do this. Do you want to come and do this for a minute? Like he had done theater most of his life. So he was just like, sure. Like, so I, I kind of got my sense of 
movie making because one of my first memories was going onto movie sets, like being on a set and watching how movies are made and, and then being able to see that finished product and be like, Oh, I remember like watching somebody pointing a camera and watching an actor do this motion like six times in a row. And then they took those like six times and they found the best one and that's editing. And like, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was even less of like just this natural watching movies and more of like, I was actually just in there, like seeing how the sausage was made from a really young age. Has it like being on sets now, has it changed quite a bit from like how they used to be ran? You know, it really hasn't like, it's all pretty much the exact same. Like I was really fortunate when I was 16, I got to work like my first actual movie. Like I got to PA and I was a bug wrangler and craft service and all this stuff on this little indie movie. My dad was helping work on and, and they were just like, you know, it's summer vacation. Like you can come and help on this movie, but like we get it if you don't want to. I'm like, I can work on a movie. And they're like, Oh, you know, we really can't afford to pay you much. I'm like, I'm going to get paid. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> and it was funny. Cause the whole time, like my dad, my dad, my whole life would just be like, you know, movies, they're so glamorous. And everybody looks at them and it's, they're so great. And it's like, they are so boring. They're so incredibly boring. Because it's like five minutes of hurry up and do this, and then two hours of sit around and wait for the next thing. And then <laughs> yeah. two minutes of hurry up and do this, and then two more hours of sit there and do nothing. And it was one of those where it was like, and he warned me. He's like, I'm going to warn you. It's going to be long days, like probably 12 to 16 hour days. Like, it's not going to be fun. You can't just be hanging out with your friends. Like, and this was in the days before cell phones were really a thing. Like I had a Nokia with snake on it. So it's like, I can play snake for nine hours or I can be over here. And, but it was really great for me because I was able to go to every single department. And because it was such a little indie movie, they were just like so willing to talk to this kid. <laughs> it's like, tell me all about your department. Tell me what you do. Tell me how you got into it. Tell me every single thing you can about filmmaking. And it was really interesting because it was like, I started making movies. I got a little Sony Handycam camcorder for like probably my seventh or eighth birthday. And from that point on, that was it. Like I was making little short films. I was doing claymation. Like I taught myself how to do stop motion stuff. I did like all kinds of just little zombie movies with toys in my bedroom at night. Like my whole life was just making terrible terrible little movies but yeah so i'm like going to all these different departments just learning about filmmaking and just learning like what goes into making a film and how many people and how many hands are involved and what all the different departments do and and how it's like these giant productions that take months to make an hour-long thing and it's like this is incredible to me that all these craftspeople are putting forth all this effort to just make something that's purely for entertainment. Like there's really not, there was no purpose of a greater educational thing. It was just a kid's movie. But at the end of that, it was, I went to everybody and everybody told me the exact same advice. Cause I would say, all right, I'm 16, in a couple of years, I'm going to be going to college. I want to go to film school. Like what advice do you have for a young filmmaker? without doubt, every single person on that set would say, okay, here's my advice. Do you want to be happy? Do you want a family? Do you want to like be in bed at night? Don't be a filmmaker. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay, okay. Which unfortunately, like to a 16 year old kid really stuck with me. And it was one of those things where it was like, okay, my whole life, my parents have been saying, Oh, you don't want to be a filmmaker. Like you can love it, but don't be a filmmaker. Like do anything else. Have a plan B because filmmaking is the worst life ever. I was like, okay, but you're my parents. You don't know anything. And then it was, okay, now I'm on a real set with real working professionals. Okay. What, what advice? Don't be a filmmaker. Okay. Okay. I'm starting to get a little disheartened here. So then comes college and 
I was looking around at different colleges and like kind of getting like, what's my best option? And, and looking mostly at the different film programs. And I ended up getting a full ride scholarship down to Dixie down in Southern Utah. So I was like, oh, cool. And then I found out that Dixie's film program at this time was like the best in Utah. It was really cool because the way it was set up was like first semester was pre-production, second semester was production, summer semester was editing. And it was like, we can teach you all the theory. We can teach you why shots are important. We can teach you why this movie, this director, this, why all this. And they're like, that's never going to do you any real world good. So we're going to throw you in the deep end. We're going to set up different departments. Each of you is going to be in a department and we're going to make a feature film. There you go. So I go down to Dixie. I'm there for the first semester. We start getting like everything set up. It's amazing. Like I put as head of the art department, we're going to be making this really cool movie. Second semester rolls around and they go, yeah, the film program is gone. There's no film program. Like, sorry. And I'm like, okay. So my whole life, my family said, don't do this. I get on a film set, working professionals say, don't do this. I still am not listening to anybody because I'm bullheaded that way. And then I get to school and move hundreds of miles away from home and comfort. And the universe says, don't do this. So that was the point when I kind of took this like, all right, all right. You're really not supposed to be a filmmaker. You're not supposed to be a storyteller. This isn't the life you're supposed to live. So that's the first time I gave up on filmmaking. Like officially, I was done. I was like, you're not a filmmaker. That's you tried, like you put forth your best effort and now you're done. So I quit filmmaking for 15 years and just worked odd jobs and became a body piercer and moved all over the country and had a life of adventure. And yeah, Here you are <laughs> yeah. And then a couple of years ago. I was just like a couple of years ago, I was, I was working at a bar as a bouncer and it was one of those, I'll never forget it. Cause it was the weirdest night where every week they play uh, bar trivia. And I would work every single bar trivia just because I love trivia. I love learning. I love useless knowledge. Like I've always said, like if I could have like focused all of my stupid brain power into something like being a doctor or a lawyer, like I could have been super rich, but for some reason I can name you like the third grip on killer clowns from outer space, but <laughs> I can't tell you anything useful in the world, but. So, yeah, so one night I'm playing bar trivia and every night, like, I would just play by myself because sitting at the door checking IDs is incredibly boring. And I was like, I'll just sit and play with them and not really care. And the hosts were really cool. And they just, like, let me play along. And so, you know, average, there were about 10 to 12 teams with about four to six people per team. And I was always playing by myself. And on this night, I got second place out of the entire bar playing by myself. And I just kind of like went home and I was so excited. I'm like, I got second place. This is incredible. Like all this useless knowledge. And I went, God damn, you are way too smart to be like wasting your life sitting on a bar stool, checking IDs. And it's like, okay, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So at that point, my, my girlfriend at the time, wife now, was just like, all right, like, if you're going to do it, just do it. Like, so I started looking into schools and looking into golf grants and scholarships. And, and it turned out to be one of those things where it was like, oh, because of my age and because it's been so long since I was in school, I was able to get grants and scholarships. And I was literally getting paid to go back to school. I was like, okay, like use the system. Let's do this. And fair fair trade-off. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I ended up going to Salt Lake Community College, mostly because it was like, I looked at all the film schools because pretty much every school was like, you've got money to burn, kid. Like, come to us. So I, I went and talked to all the different film departments and, and Salt Lake Community was really just the place where they were like, you know, we can teach you theory. We can teach you why movies are important. But 
that's not real world. So day one, we're going to have an introduction. Day two, we're going to hand you a camera and tell you to start making mistakes because then you're going to learn from those mistakes. And I went, done. So, yeah, and I, I was using school at that point. I was like, I need a refresher. I need to remember. I need to learn new technology. I need to find out like all the ways. Because when I quit filmmaking the first time, I remember Adobe Premiere like 2.1 had just came out. So it was <laughs> really, 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 really different than it is now. And I'm like, okay, you know, I can learn all the technical. But more than that, I'm like, I'm going to go to film school to meet people that want to make movies and people that want to tell stories and people that have the same passion for this crazy thing that I do. And so, yeah, yeah, that's what drives my passion, Chaz. 45 minutes later. No, dude, Dobby I love it. Storytelling. I loved it. Well, it's because you, you even said that you love to tell stories and that you're a storyteller. And like, that was a very elaborate <laughs> story. <laughs> like, tell a story for how, how you got to like where you are now. Yeah, no, I, I really love that. Um, because I don't remember how you and I met. I think Michelle, mm-hmm. she was on Facebook. And then I don't remember. There, there was a lot of people that we knew mutually. Yeah. But somehow we never like knew each other. Yeah, because my second, I think she's my second cousin. She's in one of your documentaries. Mm. Uh, Ju- Julia, with your tattoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's yeah. I, she's my second cousin, I think. If it, she's my dad's cousin, yeah. Oh, she's family <laughs> somewhere. Family somehow. <laughs> um, but seeing that how like you know you knew family members to an extent, I'm like, wow, like this is a very small world. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's incredibly, like, that's the thing is as far as I travel, like, it's such a small world. Like, you always will just run into people. Like, one of my first, like, couple weeks, I met a guy here that is from Salt Lake. And it was like, oh, like, we start talking about Salt Lake. And it's like, oh, I know this place. And it's like, oh, yeah, I know this place. And, it's like, <laughs> and before long, it became, wait, no, I do know that guy. We know somebody in common. Like, it's just way too small of a world <laughs> for as big as it is oh yeah dude that's so funny um sorry i am trying to make sure my internet does not crash again no you're good because it has been a thing um <laughs> okay so when you picked up the camera again at slick did you know that you wanted to go directly into directing or did you try to play all parts, you know, like all departments to kind of determine where you'd fit. So I always knew that I wanted to be a director ever since I was a kid and like found out what the director did. And it was, it was mostly one of those where it was less about like, I want to be in charge. I want to be the one telling everybody what to do more of like, I have this very clear vision in my head And I've watched so many movies and every time I watch a movie, I go, Oh, that's really good. But if I were doing this, this is how I would do it. And so, you know, knowing what a director did, it was, it was always, that was the direction I wanted to go. But at the same time, when I very first started like, you know, professional type work and, you know, interning PA and stuff like that, it was doing sound. It was doing craft service. It was doing, props it was doing i did a little bit with locations like i was doing everything and through those experiences i started to learn it was like oh no a really really good director knows how to do a teeny bit of everything or at least knows enough of the language to easily talk to the people that can do that a lot better than them and it was years later, I heard this great quote from James Cameron, who, or it was somebody talked about working with James Cameron. They were just like, oh, no, you don't do good on a James Cameron set because you're doing it on a James Cameron set. You do good on a James Cameron set because you know he can do your job better than you can. And you don't want to have to make him come over and teach you how to do your job. <laughs> it's like, okay, so that's, that's kind of the approach I always took. It was... I want to be a director. I want to be the best director that I can possibly be. But through that, I want to understand how the sound department works. I want to understand how the grip department works. I want to understand how 
every department that goes into making a movie works. And so when the day comes, I need to communicate with them. I could just go, I'm going to go the really long way around this, or I can just go the direct short way around this. Cause it's to me, all people that are working in arts are artists. You know, even if you're just swinging a hammer and building sets, you're still an artist and you still want to do the best job you can do. And to me, being a good director is not telling somebody how to swing the hammer. It's telling them, here's what I'm looking for. You're a professional. I want you to take this and make it the best you can make it while still living within the parameters of what I'm trying to achieve here. Because the more empowering you give like people the opportunity to be creative and do their jobs and do it well, the better they're going to want to do. You know, it's, it's one of those, it's being directors as much of a personality thing as it is being a leadership. Like to me, it's, it's, if I walk into a set, like when I was working with you doing sound, like I wasn't walking on the set being like, oh, I can do better at directing than Chaz. Cause I've done it X number of times. It was okay. I'm working on sound. I want to make sure this is the best sound Chaz can get for his project because Chaz is my friend. Like, I want to shine for him because if I shine, he shines and then we all shine and then we're all just stars in a fantastic galaxy of filmmaking. And you did help us shine that project. <laughs> Dude. I my, love that project. One of my favorite, one of my favorite parts of that project is like, not only is Lorenzo just sitting on the toilet, but it's the, how we had to <laughs> have you hide in the, in bathtub. the bathtub and like literally I, um, I, like I had to kind of like zoom in just a little bit, like you know, on the frame, and yeah. like, like the mic is like, if you just move like a centimeter of the frame, like you could see the mic. <laughs> like that's yeah. how. Uh, I, I loved it. Like I, I love that project, and I. I remember shooting that. And just be like, all right, Chaz, we can go above, but I'm not going to get as good a sound if I go from below. <laughs> you're going to have to kind of maybe crop in. Look, I cannot go farther than the ground. <laughs> That was so much fun. It was just like hanging out in a bathtub and people forgetting you're in there while he's just sitting on the can. It's like, this is my life. This well, is my life. Lorenzo would like fart on accident. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just yeah like, that was fun to hear. <laughs> oh boy. But see, it's, those, it's those memories that like, uh, like I was talking, so uh, Justice, yeah, do you know Justice Page? Uh-uh. Okay. He's a cinematographer. Um, but he was on my lot or on the episode that I recorded earlier today. Oh, cool. So the last episode by the time this comes out. Yeah. 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 Um, and we were talking about how like a lot of our favorite memories happen to be on film sets. Yeah. It's not so much like the process of making the film, but it's just like everything that happens while making the film, you know, like, uh, like the shenanigans and like all the jokes and just like the interacting, like there's so oh, many yeah. fun. Things. And like with you, with um, Lilith, you know, like when we were making that, and we were shooting at that park super late at night with a super loud generator. I don't know how we did get cops called on us, <laughs> but just like we had a mannequin and like that mannequin would like be placed creepy, like yeah. we would place it like in the darkness where you see a silhouette. Oh, dude. And it's just like, I, I, it was so much fun, you know, to stay up that late, that late at night and really pull that off. I still will never forget when we were standing on the bridge and you were down in the dry riverbed and I had that baby head covered in blood and I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to try and throw this right in front of Chaz and like scare him. And it like hits you right in the shoulder. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> oh, your face was priceless though. That place oh. was creepy enough at like 2 a.m. anyway. And then get hit by a bloody baby head. Yeah, dude, like that. That's an interesting place. And that's a. Uh... I, I don't know how we didn't get cops called on us though, because like that oh, generator yeah. was like super loud in like the person's backyard. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever told you this story. This is a pretty great one, but we were filming a short and in the short, there's a part where this guy kills this girl with a hammer, like in this park again. So it's like, we're in this park, like poor girl laying on the ground in the like freezing cold, covered in blood. And so, we, we wrap up, you know, it's late. It's like two, three in the morning. 
nobody remembers to clean up all of the fake blood off of the concrete. <laughs> so like a couple days, it was probably like a week later. I'm like just out running errands. It's the middle of the night. Cause I'm a night owl and I'm always up late. So I like, I just grab some fast food and I'm like, Oh, I'm right by that park. Like I'll just go and sit in the parking lot and enjoy this, like watch the stars. And so I'm like sitting in the parking lot and I see this guy walking his dog with a flashlight and, you know, not not thinking anything. I was just eating my food. And I see this guy walk over to this like, um, like restroom type area, and he like gets really close to the door, and he throws it open. He points the flashlight in, and he's like looking around. And I'm like, what in the hell is going on? And, like, comes around to the other side of the ladies' room, and he like does the same thing. He throws the door open. He's looking around. And I'm like, okay, I gotta know. Like, I gotta know what's going on. So I'm like open my car and I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, I know it's late. Like, hope I'm not bothering you. Like, was there like a problem lately or something? He's like, Oh, you know, there was just some suspicious activity. I'm like, what kind of suspicious activity? Like this was not a crime ridden neighborhood by any stretch. And it's like, we came to the park not long ago and there was just a pool of blood. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> Oh no. Oh, oh no. <laughs> like neighborhood watch was just like convinced there were Satanists sacrificing goats up there or something. And so I'm just like, thank you. And I just booked it. I'm like never coming back to this park again. We, um, I think we were trying to recreate the scene from reservoir dogs where he's dancing, mm-hmm. you know, and the torture. And we used so much fake blood in my parents' old house garage. Yeah. That, that stained the cement. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I didn't tell my sister. And she like came home from hanging out with her friends after we got done shooting. <laughs> and like she kind of got like ugh, spooked by this like stain on the ground. And she's like, is this one of your projects? And I'm like, yeah, it, <laughs> it was. And I'm like... And they're trying to sell the house. And I'm like, do, do we disclose that that's fake blood? Like, <laughs> do we have to disclose that? Or <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. So it was, it was fun. And like, even with, um, see, I do that house. I don't know. Because with Secrets Within, we had more blood. Uh-huh. And we moved maybe like a week after we shot there. And in this one room, we got specks of blood accidentally on the wall. Oh no! And you know, because Landon and Emily, the, the actors, they would uh, use the wall for support because, like, the characters would have to fall. And I don't know if we got all the blood splotches. Like, I don't know <laughs> if the n- new owners wonder if we were crazy or yeah. I, I don't know. I think making no. movies is fun though. And I I don't know if you were there the night for Night of Adventure. I don't think you were. I think Hawk was the sound guy. Um, it was during like one of the fight sequences uh, when she like pushes Aiden over, mm-hmm. and they were yelling at each other. And one of the neighbors comes out, <laughs> and like he like, he comes up to like smoke a cigarette, right? And then like he looks over and he's like, "What?" And so he starts walking over like, you know, like a yeah, yeah, big dude. And I'm like, oh, please, dude, do not interrupt the scene. Not like when we're in the middle of like film. And granted, it's like two o'clock in the morning, right? And he uh, he's like, oh, okay. And he like comes over to us and he doesn't intervene at all. He just watches. And I'm like, this is weird. Okay. And then after, you know, we say cut. He's like, yeah, I heard the yelling. And I'm like, do I have to come over and kick some ass? But then he's like, <laughs> but I see like the boom mic and the camera. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we were, we were making a move. And he's like, nice. And he like just blew out some smoke and walked back into his house. I'm like two o'clock in the morning. Like what? Yeah, I've always said like that's the perfect like if you want to get away with a murder, you just make it look like a film set. Like (laughs) my neighbors never questioned anything I was doing in all the years we were making movies. So they're just like, oh, he's making another one. I'm like, there are people screaming, covered in blood, (laughs) people walking around with bloody axes. Like, and our neighbors are just like, oh, cool. What's this one about? So funny. You, okay, you were in charge of the um, Fr- Friday the 13th musical, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Do, you want, do you want to talk about that for a bit? Sure. What would you like to know about it? Well, because you mentioned Bloody Axe, and I'm like, does the Bloody Axe have to do with that project? 
Yeah, that project, I've used axes in a lot of projects, <laughs> frighteningly, but yeah, that project literally stemmed out of the trailer for Cannibal the, Thir- Cannibal the Musical, because in the trailer, they go, in the vein of Oklahoma and Friday the 13th, part four. And I went, what if you really made Oklahoma and Friday the 13th part four into one entity. And yeah, it was, we were doing one of those like 48 hour film challenge type things. And, and I just like put it out to every actor I knew and everybody, I was like, I need a cabin. I need someone that can sing. I need a (laughs) lot of people that are willing to die in really grotesque ways. And, you know, through that, like I met, I met some amazing actors. I met my makeup guy who is just incredible. I met, you know, I just, I had people that were just all willing to help out. It was like, I had a friend of a friend that's like, Oh, we've got a cabin like up in the middle of Oakley, Utah, which I'm like, I don't even know where Oakley is, but sure. (laughs) And, you know, they were just super cool. And so yeah, we, we ended up, I took the song memory from cats and then melded it into Friday the 13th Part 2. And the whole idea was this girl singing about having memories of being at summer camp and how everything went wrong when this killer came about and started, like, <laughs> murdering all of her friends. And, and it just turned into this just ridiculous, insane little short film. And... You know, I've had, I've always had really weird luck with short films and projects and stuff like that in general. Cause you know, I, with, with a lot of projects, you put your heart and soul into it and it's like, okay, this is like as good as I can humanly make it. And now I'm just going to send it out to the universe and hope to get into festivals that people like it. And I think I submitted that to probably 20 film festivals and it did not get into any. And it was just like, <laughs> Okay, when they talk about that filmmaking is a life of rejection, this is what they're talking about. (laughs) I poured my heart and soul into this, and nothing comes of it. But through that, like, a couple months after it was rejected by every film festival, and I was on to, you know, six other things I was, like, trying to get going, and I got this email from the organizers of this one film festival in Florida that were having a... Friday the 13th part two anniversary screening, right? You know, we're going to have some of the cast here. We're going to have this big screen, this giant party. Would it be okay for us to show your short film before we show the movie? And I'm like, this is better than getting into a (laughs) festival. Like this is, this to me, you being people that were in Friday the 13th part two are going to see my terrible little cat's memory. Friday the 13th short? I'm like, yes, I wanted to go to Florida for that so bad. Like, Did you I go? got some pictures, but no, I've still never been to Florida. But one day, one day I'll get to be a Florida man. Yeah, with Florida, I, I, I jokingly question if it's even a real place because of how right? much insanity stems from there. It's like, is that even a real place? Like, Oh, yeah, it seems like, like a, a twilight mess. zone. Yeah. <laughs> You cross the state line, dude. Like, you cross the state line, and all of a sudden, like, you disappear. Oh, yeah. No. Nobody knows if you're alive or dead. <laughs> That's why you never hear about, like, New York man visiting Florida. It's always Florida man. Florida <laughs> man does this. Florida man does that. Because the yeah. second you step in, you can't get back out, and you become a Florida man. Yeah, and there's, there's that game going on Facebook or whatever where you type in your birth date with Florida man, and there's, like, always some <laughs> crazy-ass story in Florida. <laughs> I think mine was like this guy murdered his wife over some potatoes or something. Oh, I'm gonna have to try that. I haven't, I haven't even seen that. Yeah, I'm not much of a social media though, so I'm not surprised. I know you're always quiet. Like when you moved, dude. Like when you moved, we we're just like, deuce. That's the hardest thing, is because like I know social media is super important, and it's like you need to get on social media to gain a following so that people like know when your projects are happening. And it's just like, I did not grow up with social media. So to me, it's not just secondary. It's like this whole different thing. And it's like, I have to think about it. And then 
Like, what if I put something on social media and in 10 years, somebody's like, well, that's triggering. Like now you're canceled because you like <laughs> craft Mac and cheese in 2009. It's like, you know, craft was racist. It's just Mac and cheese. Mm-hmm. Ah, dude, that's like, the thing. I, I, so I've, I told myself last year that I wouldn't be posting any political stuff. Mm-hmm. And now how can you not? there's that one like this this year i remember i remember my first political post was when certain somebody decided to bomb another place and i'm like really like this is a diversion then i deleted that post and then COVID hit and like (laughs) dude it's like everything went like politically dumb like oh yeah like you're just like how can i not talk about this right and so I've been trying to ease off of that because I know that's not why people go to my page. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that's the hard part because I'm, I'm one of those people who I'm like, I would rather spread positivity and happiness into the world than more negativity. Like the world's got enough negativity, but yeah, sometimes finding positivity is a little harder than other days. So, I mean, and like the positive note was like when tenant released its trailer and I was like, yay. Mm-hmm. Now it's back to being pushed back. You're like, oh, damn it. <laughs> but, but think how excited you'll be when it finally does come out. Oh, dude. So I was actually, I was talking to Justice and we were saying, um, like the, the question that was asked was like, what's the last movie you saw in theater before mm-hmm. the pandemic? And then I'm like, I, I, it's going to be such a weird feeling walking back into a movie theater. Oh, yeah. And it holding in that excitement, you know, like it's going to be so weird. Oh uh, yeah. So, well, yeah, that's um, one thing. That is one thing that is so different here than it was in Utah is like people take movies with them. big respect in this city. Like people aren't talking through the movies. They're not just like munching loudly on candy and popcorn. <laughs> like they're just focused on the movie and it's so refreshing. It's because Utah is all about the family. Oh yeah, family, kids, dude. I remember I saw Incredibles two during the matinee, and I didn't know that moms like to take kids in the middle of the day to go see Pixar. That's not what my mom used to do. So I was like, "This is weird." And those kids were running around the whole theater during the whole screening, and I'm like, Ugh. "I should have picked a later time." Right. Like I, did, I did this because. I had nothing to do when it was like me enjoying my time. And then, I, yeah, it was, it was a bad experience. That's <laughs> rough. Centerville, Centerville, dude. That's, that's bad. Oh yeah. That's a good theater though. So IMAX, <sighs> go IMAX or go home. Does, <laughs> oh, does Los Angeles have like specific IMAX theaters? Oh Lord. they are so, okay. So the theaters we go to, like we live, about half a block from a theater that's kind of like the uh, the Tower or the Broadway, where it's like the more indie movies, and which is really cool because they do a lot of like really little like indie premieres there, and so you can meet like indie filmmakers, which is super super dope. And the fact that I can just walk there is super cool. But like up the road in Burbank, we have the AMCs, and AMC does this pass where for twenty three dollars a month you can see up to three movies a week. So it's just like, okay, I'd be stupid not to do this like all the time. And within two blocks, there are three theaters, <laughs> like, and they're all AMCs. So there's like the AMC six, the AMC eight, and then the AMC sixteen. And the 16 has like the big IMAX theater and all that. And then the other ones are like this, the eight is like more of the big comfy, cozy chairs. And like, it's just nuts. How many theaters there are everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That's not like Utah. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Dude. I'm, I love the tower. I think the last time I went to the tower was for a Nicolas Cage movie. It was great. Was it Mandy? No, it was the color from out of space um, or the color of out of space or whatever. Color from color from color out of space. 
yeah. color out of space. Yeah. Color out of space. Um, I just know how much you love your Mandy. Dude, Mandy's metal. Okay. Wait, that's the thing. Like that's <laughs> these like small theaters offer so much potential of gaining a cult following for a reason. Like with, with Mandy, when that first premiered in Utah, not at Sundance, mm-hmm. but like, you know, at the tower theater. Yeah. Only word we got from it was from Sundance. Like that was all the hype. It was like Nicholas Cage at his finest. And you're like, what the fuck? I, I got to see this. Like, wait, what? And nobody knew what to expect walking in. <laughs> and then seeing how like not serious it was by, you know, like half hour into it, you're like, can I laugh? And people right? started laughing and cheering. And that's how I knew it was to become a cult movie. Like, being there in that whole experience was so fantastic. And it was the same thing with the color out of space one. Yeah. It was the same exact thing. And I also saw the director's cut for uh, the house that Jack built. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, Lars von Trier is a very controversial figure. To say in the a way. <laughs> And uh, I, I saw that with Landon and people were either shocked or people were laughing because of how ridiculous the premise was. And like, I, I was one of the ones laughing and Landon's like, how can you laugh at this? Like, this is so fucked up. Yeah. Like, dude, this, he's trolling. Like, there's no way yeah. in hell he's being serious about this movie. Like, this is just to piss people off. Literally. That is it. Yeah, and that's one of those things that I just, I love about <laughs> horror movies in general is that, you know, one person can watch a horror movie with like their eyes covered and not be able to watch the screen. And then others are just laughing and so comforted by it. It's like a warm blanket to them. And, mm. and you know, to me, it's most of the time horror is just, it is funny. It's just over the top and exaggerated. And that's why movies like Green Room like, and like Hereditary are the ones that I'm like, oh no, this is horrifying because the violence is not fun violence. This is just, gore violence that is very real very practical and we saw we saw hereditary together with um Mm -hmm. was jonathan yeah we did that for the wrap on lilith yeah man that movie i I tell people that's the one movie that i got really spooked after the viewing for whatever reason i don't know why but i had to smudge myself when i got home oh yeah i love that movie it's that's a great one but um okay so uh how do you handle self-doubt then being a storyteller and a filmmaker oh jesus i wish i didn't (laughs) (laughs) i I find self-doubt is like i'm I'm a person that grew up i was kind of i think one of the reasons i love horror is i was a kid that was kind of afraid of everything like every noise every creak every crack it was like something's in the dark something's gonna get me something's out there and And I've kind of positioned myself now to where I never say no to anything because I just want to experience everything I can. And, and through that, I've experienced so many things that's like, okay, worst case scenario is going to be this. And so like you experience enough things and it's just like, I'm not really afraid of anything anymore. Like physically, like, Literally, if someone like pulls a gun out and points it at me, I'm like, okay, I know exactly like worst case scenario of what's (laughs) about to happen. But taking something that is your art and your passion and this thing that you have sunk a deeper part of yourself into, like, that is, it's to me, art's always been about revealing parts of me that I don't show the world and especially parts about me that I might not even know really exist or tap into like not to go down like a really dark hole, but I've, I've noticed a lot of my subject matter always has to do with suicides lately. And like, why is it the last like four scripts I've written all have these like dramatic suicide scenes in them. And I was like, really like psychologically trying to break it down. I'm like, I'm not a suicidal person. I've never had depression, I've never had anxiety, but like I've dealt with suicide that is outside of me. I've dealt with friends that have like tried to take their own lives or have taken their own lives. It's like, to me, I think it's that tapping into that fear of not being in control of something. It's like, if somebody, if I'm doing it, I'm in complete control. But when my characters are doing it, they're kind of taking this thing that is like 
this this lack of control that I feel and and is honestly probably the thing that still drives me the most nuts. Like I'm a person that can't be a passenger in a car because I hate being out of control. Like it just it drives me up a wall. But but yeah, when when I'm doing my art and doing like writing and doing filmmaking and stuff, and I'm putting it out there, it's just like what if people don't like it? What if I don't like it? What if it's not good enough? What if the universe hates it? Like, and it's, it, for a lot of years, I would just do things and never show them to anybody because it was never about public consumption. It was never about what people thought. It was always just about, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this to get this out. Like it just needs to not be in me anymore. And then I started doing these writing contests. Like my mom was like, you know, you're such a good writer. You should start like doing some of these contests and just seeing. And I was like, but what if people don't like it? And I would sit there and I'd write something. I'd be so happy. I'd be like, oh my God, this is like the best it can be. And then I'd go to the submit button and I'd just hover and hover and hover. I'd be like, why can't you do this? Why can't? And I'd start having like anxiety attacks and panic attacks. Be like, Okay. Okay. Worst case scenario is everybody hates it and you get last place in this contest. I'm like, what if you get last place in this contest? Oh God, were you a failure? Are you terrible? Should you never do anything like this? Should you never like, should you not pursue this thing that you have always known that was in you and that was the only thing that was going to make you happy? And I was like, okay, 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 okay. And you know, with age, it's definitely changed with doing it more. It's changed with feeling more comfortable it's changed but to me it's 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 really has become less about people's acceptance or not acceptance and it's just this is what it is like it's not going to be for everybody everybody's not going to like it and honestly i don't want everybody to like all of my work like but at the end of the day it's i think artists are always their hardest critic because we're never pleased with ourselves. And so to me, it's, it's never about like, if I write a script, like if I send you a script, I'm not sitting there going, what if Chaz doesn't like it? I'm sitting there going, what if I'm not good enough? What if I haven't done well enough? What if Chaz doesn't like it because I'm not good? And, you know, it's one of those like, I watched this documentary not long ago about Spielberg and even Spielberg says like when I step onto a set every time I have butterflies because I think what if somebody finally figures out he doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> and to me I'm just like okay if one of the greatest filmmakers of all time can still at this point in his career be like I suck I'm not good I have self-doubt like then it's okay for me to do it so you know, honestly, I struggle with self-doubt. I am terrified of it, but you just, you have to push through because the worst thing that's going to happen is people aren't going to like it. And if people don't like it, like, do you like it? Because if you don't like it, then obviously it's not done. Like, keep going, keep going until you like it. I know I say this, but it's like, I never like anything that I do. <laughs> so. I mean, a roundabout way. Like, I don't, I don't get over self, self critique and and that whole like being weary. Have Have you found it that there has to be a, a passing of time before you can actually appreciate what you're trying to do with a certain project or a certain no, I, story? Or... I I still don't think I can appreciate any of my work. I think that, like, but it's. I appreciate the craft. I appreciate what everybody else around me brings to a project, but I, I always have such a hard time seeing what I brought to it. But it's, it's always one of those where, you know, my wife always has to remind me, she's like, be the director. You brought all these puzzle pieces together. You brought in these people, you brought in the page, like the passion, you brought in everybody wanting to do a good job. And so, like I can appreciate my projects because I can appreciate the amazing work that the people that I surround myself with have done. And, you know, that's why I love actors. Like I love actors that 
can take words on a page and make them seem organic and real and like they haven't been read through a million times. And, you know, I appreciate writers because when I can like read a book or even read like a comic book and just burst into tears at the end of it and just be like, oh my God, like these are real people to me because they're real stories and they're just so real. But like for me to sit and like, feel emotions over something I've made personally just doesn't happen like at all. It has once, once it happened, but I think that was more of just like this, this shouldn't be real, but it is, and you made it and this is incredible, but I don't know if that was the actual project itself or just all the surrounding bullshit that we have to deal with. Could be a mix of all things. Oh, for sure. For sure. Hey, I have a really random question. Yeah. Do you still have your dog? Yeah, she's sleeping on the couch right now. <gasps> oh, Ruby. I'm really shocked she hasn't been like a total pain in my ass this entire time. <laughs> so usually I get on something like this and she's just like, now I want to go out. Now I want treats. Now I want attention. Like, why are you doing something else? Come on. See, I miss your dog, even though she, I don't know if she liked me, but she was a cute she dog. She likes everybody. <laughs> Said she's, you. She's intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> she is. She's, she's like this ferocious seeming thing that doesn't understand that she's not a lap dog. Like she's, she's an enigma. She's so cute though. She is. She's great. She's my best friend. Um, have you been to an LA premiere yet then? Since you've been there? Not like an official premiere. We've gone to a couple screenings of things and a couple like preview showings. And we, we actually were like on Hollywood Boulevard when they were setting up for the Onward premiere, but we left before it actually started. But that'd be yeah, fun. We've been, been living the Hollywood life. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, now here's a real question. Then the cost of living compared to Utah, is it exaggerated as people say or is it actual ex- expensive? Right. So <laughs> this is the thing was coming out here like the biggest things every single person would tell us would be oh there's so much traffic. There's so much traffic. Everywhere is traffic. Everywhere you want to go is traffic, traffic, traffic. And we're like yeah, like it's LA. There's traffic. We get it. And then everybody would be like, oh, the cost of living is so crazy. It's so expensive. Like the cost of living is just astronomical. And I'm like, okay, okay. And then we get here and it's like, okay, our rent is like a couple hundred dollars more than what we pay in like downtown Salt Lake, but like not anywhere close to what we were anticipating. Like we were expecting gas to be like two, three dollars more a gallon. Gas is the exact same as Salt Lake right now. Like food costs the exact same. And I'm like, so you're telling me other than rent, that's really the only thing that costs more, like across the board. I'm like, like movies, movies are stupid expensive. Like a movie ticket here is like twenty three dollars for an IMAX movie, and it's like cool. Just for one ticket. Yeah, but through that AMC pass where you get three movies a week, you can go see IMAX. You can go see three D. Like it's like okay, so it's actually way less than I was paying in Utah <laughs> to go see movies for better screens and better sound and better quality. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, don't I mean, know. it's 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 all relative to to like minimum wage, like like jobs here pay way better than they do in Salt Lake. So, like Julie's job, she's literally getting paid twice as much as she was at her last job in Utah. So it's like, okay, so are paying a little bit more in rent, but making twice as much money. Okay, cool. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> It's not luck, man. It's just <laughs> devoting yourself to trying and just seeing where it takes you and, you know, just throwing your jumping into the deep end and seeing how cold the water is. Dude, people here miss you. Just so you know, though, I worked uh, on, um, 
a project of Jonathan a couple months ago. Uh huh. Obviously, before COVID hit. <laughs> right. I think it was like February. Uh, or early, dude, I don't know. It was like right before COVID hit. Like, I'm like thinking about it. Um, I'm like, and I told him, I was like, this is weird without Deuce. And he's like, yeah, I miss him. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but at least we made friends out of it. <laughs> Right, but I'm trying to like I'm just trying to like lay the path and find people here and start bringing you guys out. Like John came and shot a project for me out here by Elso. What? Yeah, it was funny because like he was just coming out for vacation. Like him and his girlfriend were coming out for vacation. I was like, oh cool. And then like I got approached to direct this little short for one of my actor friends, and I was like, what dates are you looking at? And they're like, we can do it this weekend. And I'm like that's a weekend John's here. Like, <laughs> hey man, I know it's really weird. This is not why you're here, but do you want to like shoot a little short film while you're here? He's like, yes, I do. So, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to lay the groundwork so I can like get you guys out here. Oh, that's funny. That was, that's cute of John to do that. Right. Oh, we had so much fun. Yeah. I, I do not miss a single thing about Utah except for my film friends. Like you don't like see yourself every moving day, back. Like, what's that? You don't see yourself moving back. No, no. We we've already said we're like, you know, if we do end up leaving LA for some reason, like we're not gonna go back to Utah. Like we don't know where we're gonna go, but not back to Utah. There's too big of a world out there to see and experience to just stay in Utah forever. Yeah. I feel that. I want to explore. I really well, that's, do. That's, I, am, you know, I almost, well, I almost went um, even to like, it was like a beer train in Colorado. Yeah. I've never been to Colorado. And so my my oh, mom and I were going to go and then COVID hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to keep planning all this stuff though. Cause I got to get out of Utah sooner or later. Well, you know, and that's the thing is like, you know, Utah can always be home. It can always be your home base. But like in those 15 years that I took off from filmmaking, I still say those were the best years I could ever have to become a better filmmaker because yeah. I went out and I had experiences and I met people and I got stories. And, you know, it's, it's like when I listen to your podcast, I'm listening to all these kids that are like 20, 22. And I'm just like, God, what I would not give to be coming at this career from that age again. Cause you know, it's, it's, I feel, cause I'm, when I came back to filmmaking, I was 31, 32. And it was like, I was the old man walking into that classroom being like, <laughs> okay, I am twice as old. Like some of these kids could be my kids. Like I'm so old and like, okay, I can do this. And, and that's probably the hardest part about coming here has been, we've met some incredible people and, it's so cool that like everywhere you turn, there are filmmakers and actors and people just wanting to create and artists and musicians. And yeah, and we've met some really incredible people, but every one of them, I'm like, you're a baby. You are a complete baby. And I'm like, oh, it's so cute. And yeah, you know, that's, that's one thing. Cause for a long time, I was so mad at myself and I beat myself up and I was like, you could have been working for 15 years that you were just doing other things. You were off exploring the world and living in strange places and meeting weirdos and just having insane once in a lifetime experiences. But no, you could have been working. You could have been trying to make your dream happen. And I was like, one day I just stepped back and was like, oh no, you needed once in a lifetime experiences. You had nothing to say. You had no voice. You had no experience. And now when I sit down in front of a keyboard, I can go, oh, you remember that one time with those drug dealers and the AK-47s? What? Yeah, that shit was crazy. I bet that would make a pretty good story. I'm just like, uh. it gives you these like, times you like i can draw back on that and make a really compelling story out of this because i know exactly how it turned out so it's kind of like you're unknowingly working towards your goal oh yeah in hindsight yeah. yeah and that's the thing is that's why it drives me so nuts when people are just like you know i'm not doing enough i'm not trying hard enough i'm not doing this and i'm like okay then just get out and do something else. Like don't try and focus on the here and now that you're not doing, like 
take a walk, step outside your apartment, like see, just talk to someone, like find a homeless person and just ask them a question because they're still just people. Like some of the most fascinating humans I've ever met have been homeless people. Like finding out how they got there and like what advice they would have to not turn into them. And like, I mean, everybody's got a story. That's the thing. Every single person has a story. And 99% of people think their story is so boring because they just live that story every day. Like to them, that story is, oh, this is just life. This is what I do every day. And I'm like, that's, that's the thing. It's like, but your story is unique. Your story is, and at the same time, it's not unique. Like your story is incredibly yours, incredibly unique but it's relatable to a plethora of other people because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we all have the same feelings and the same emotions and the same dreams. Now that storytelling to me is just that relating to a story that somebody else's, but is also yours. You know, it's like, I know Arrival was like one of your favorite movies ever. Like you got your tattoo. Yeah. And it's like, You've never experienced communication with aliens. Oh, hell no, dude. I'd probably shit myself. (laughs) Yeah, but I guarantee you've had a point in your time where you've tried to communicate with another person and just couldn't figure out the right way to do it. Yeah. I think I I recently saw um, The King of Staten Island. Mm -hmm. How was that? I loved it. I Check it out. Yeah, dude, I seriously loved it. I thought I, I watched it twice actually. Um, huh. it had like a seventy-two rental or seventy-two yeah, yeah, hour yeah. rental, but I, I loved it. And like the situations these characters found themselves in, because like I think Judd Ap- like Judd Apatow has a huge talent for making the mundane have depth. You know, like oh for sure, like it's everyday lifestyles that are interesting in some way. You know, and uh, that's certainly the case with uh that movie and like exploring the themes of like fatherhood you know like not having a father or like having your mom move on move on move on in her life or you know your sister moving away like it's like those things where i'm like damn like this film's kind of <laughs> kind of like really like relatable in that sense you know and there's like a part yeah. where like he's yelling at his um mom's boyfriend which is bill burr so it was like mm-hmm. fascinating watching that but like and they get this huge argument. I'm like, I can relate to that because I've had been in arguments with my stepdad, you know, like it's, I don't know. It's like those moments are super relatable, like you're talking about. And Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Like I love that movie. So you should check it out. I mean, it's not the I mean, worst, worst thing to come out in the pandemic. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the one thing that like has been the best and worst for me about this whole thing is like as much as I love movies, I never get to watch them because I am always busy. Like yeah. I am always, I, if I am not editing, I'm writing. If I'm not writing, I'm doing something else. Like I'm constantly working, but like, I never like find the time to just sit and force myself to just watch a movie. And like, that's been through this. I'm just like, I'm going to start just watching movies, like catching up on all these movies that I have put off for years. And I'm like, I thought of you because I was watching Sicario for the first time. Mm. And I watched Creed for the first time. <laughs> and like all these movies, I'm like, how have I still never watched these? These are incredible films. Yeah, dude, Sicario slap. I um when Dune actually released the images in Vanity Fair or whatever, and like Twitter went wild, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, I have to watch all of Denny's movies tonight and tomorrow like i'm like i have to just to celebrate this moment so i rewatched sicario like i think a couple months ago and i was going to write yeah. a piece for it for patrick's website like about all this filmography and i'm still debating on doing that but i'm like i'll probably wait for the trailer like the second we get the <laughs> teaser for that i'm like i'll, I'll geek the fuck out on all those movies <laughs> oh yeah now that's that's been one thing that i'm like as bad as, as the world is in an awful place like truly like it's an awful place but it's to me it's so exciting to see the art that's going to come out of it Uh uh-huh because i'm just like you know every especially being a horror fan like horror is always to me a mere representation of the world that we're living in done through a very exaggerated way and i'm just like 
I am so excited to see the way that artists interpret what's going on everywhere. And like the like crazy stories that are going to come out of this. I'm just, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those, I'm so excited to be living in a transformative time for the world. Cause I'm like, the world is never going to be the same. Like, I still remember when 9-11 happened and like waking up and it was my first year of college and I had new student orientation and I turned on the TV, I like rubbing the sleep out of my eyes and I look up at the TV and I'm like, why are they showing the towering inferno at like 9 a.m.? I'm like, this is not a morning movie. I'm like, oh, so I like, you know, get up, I change the channel and it's like, what do you mean the World Trade Center was hit by an airplane? Like trying to wrap my head around this. And I like call my mom and I'm like, is this real life? And like at that moment, the second plane hits and I'm like, this is not, the world is different now. The world is not the same after this exact moment in time. It was just like crazy to be living this again. Like the world was never going to be the same after this. No. And like, I've, uh, I was actually talking to my mom about that couple days ago where I said every time period like whenever like a bad pandemic hit or a bad war hit there's always a great outcome of art you know Mm -hmm. like there's always some sort of movement and some sort of revitalization of art forms that surge and like I'm like and I told I'm like I don't know like with sci-fi because like you know I'm like I love sci-fi the 2010s were like huge sci-fi i mean like interstellar arrival inception even you know like huge ideas right that you couldn't really come up with back in like 2000s oh for and sure and now and i'm like what do the 2020s have <laughs> yeah. like no, they it's, just it's it's gonna be even more expansion you know like of oh, i don't yeah. know it's collective collective consciousness like expansive expansion for film and art oh, yeah. in general. I'm, I'm so excited to like see what comes out of all of this. Like, I just have a feeling that like punk rock is going to have a major resurgence. Like punk has always been that anti-establishment, like fuck you. I'm not going to do what you tell me rage against the machine type thing. And it's like, Oh no, this is when like normal people are in this mindset, like <laughs> the musicians, they're going to be having a field day. And I know uh, Rage Against the Machine actually broke some records on Spotify for having like a huge increase. And I'm like, yeah. I, uh, people are waking up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, I'm like, how can you not feel angry? Listen to that. Like, you want to enforce change after listening to that kind of music, you know, like, mm-hmm. and like when he's like, you know, fuck you, I want to do it. Tell me, like, you feel that. It's not like, oh, well, he's telling me rage. to feel that. Like, you just, you feel that. You're like, yeah. I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> like for me, Rage came out. I remember Evil Empire came out like when I was in high school. So it was like that perfect culmination of like, my parents are the worst. Society isn't getting me. <laughs> this band, this band gets me. Uh, uh, that's so great. So old. <laughs> <laughs> you're not that old. You're, I'm you know, you're fish- in a couple years. I think you're officially the oldest guest I've had on here. Oh boy, thanks. If you want to take that. <laughs> <laughs> you're not that old, old man. Go um, comb your gray hair. Okay, let's start wrapping this up. All Just right. A little bit. Um I'm gonna ask you two questions. Okay, I'm ready. You ready for this? How do you hope you can inspire others by pursuing this craft? I I think it goes back to that whole, like, just try to talk to my younger self. Like, I just, I hope that, like, when I was a kid, I was watching a lot of movies and I found so much solace from those storytellers. And, you know, there's been a couple times in my life when I've been able to meet filmmakers and just be like, thank you. Like, thank you for telling your stories. And I know I'm not the only person that has gotten, like, these messages from your movies but just thank you for putting that out into the world and and you know it's one of those where if like this this one day happened where i was working on that that tattoo documentary and i went to julia and i'm just like you know what if nobody likes this like what's the point of doing all this and she's like remember like 
how you feel when you get to like meet people that have changed your life with like filmmakers that like really touched you and changed your perspective. I'm like, yeah. She's like, what if some kid came up to you and was just like, thank you. And I just started bawling. I'm like, I couldn't handle that. But she's like, but that's what you're in it for is to like inspire people and try and like give them that same thing. And, you know, I think to me, like, if at the end of the day, when I'm taking my last breath, when if like one person has seen something that I've made and something I've put out into the world and, and it's just made them smile or just brought them a little bit of hope in a hopeless time when it's like, shit's bad. Shit gets bad for everybody. Like there are times when it seems like we're at the bottom of the barrel. And like, if one more bad things happens, like we don't know how we're going to handle it. And then like you turn on that song or you read that, like it doesn't even have to be a book, like a sentence or you see a movie or something. And it's just like, okay, I can keep pushing tomorrow. Like tomorrow's going to be better than today. So like, I guess for me, it's just, I would want to just tell people like, you're never too old. Like shit, I'm coming at this. <laughs> I'm literally getting internships as a 40 year old almost. And I'm just like, but you know what? Like you've done this and I haven't, that's all I want. I want somebody to help me like, cause hell, if I'm starting at 40, that means I've got 40 years left that I can push really fucking hard and make some really cool shit. Like, you know, I mean, it's, if just one person was going to give up and decide to keep pushing one more day because of something I did or something I said, like I've done enough. Like I can die a very happy man at that point. So I love that. That's a very, it's a very humbling. It's sappy. It's dumb. <laughs> I love, no, dude, I love that. No. <laughs> and then to, to, to finish this off, ready for this? Ready. What's one piece of advice that's actually stuck with you throughout the years and how do you apply that? So for me, there's never one piece of advice. Advices. Specifically, (laughs) but it's like, I will hear things daily that just inspire me. Like, I don't know if you've seen that Joe Bob Briggs came back with the last drive in on shutter. And a couple weeks ago, he did this double feature with one cut of the dead and, and uh, trauma, trauma's war. And he does this incredible speech at the end of the show about like, like uh, essentially just like, you know, um, Oh fuck. Why can't I think of the word? Oh, fuck aspiring. That's what it was. His whole thing was like, you know, if you wake up tomorrow and you've made a film, you're a filmmaker, you know, fuck being an aspiring filmmaker. That's bullshit. And I'm just like, that's true. Like you're doing it. You're fucking doing it, man. Like just get out there. You're doing more than a million people. And yeah, you know, that's the thing to me is it's, it's the chances of coming out to Hollywood and making it as a filmmaker are like one in a billion. And I totally get that. And I appreciate it, but I'm like, but it's still one. Like somebody has got to be that one. <laughs> Why does it want me? You know, there's, there's fuck aspiring. That's always been big for me lately. Like, um, a filmmaker I heard once talked about, like, you know, if you get in a room of a hundred people, you say, look to your right and look to your left. And of this hundred people, 99 of you are never going to make it. If you're that one person sitting there going, wow, 99 of these people are really wasting their time. Cause I'm that one person that's going to make it like, cool like then you might become a filmmaker (laughs) you know to me it's it's follow that delusion follow that like follow that idea that you're gonna be the one like why the fuck not like when neo stepped out of the matrix he didn't believe he was the one but you know what keanu reeves can do anything so damn dude a way to bring keanu reeves onto this (laughs) everybody needs keanu reeves in their lives (laughs) You know, I mean, like one, one, one more quick story for you. Cause it's okay. one of those that's like always stuck for me. And I'm going to try and get through this without tears. Cause this story like always Dude, gets me, but no, I mean, if, if you end up crying, I'll, I will tell you a story that made me cry. It relates to something you've already said. All right. So, so when I was in 
think second grade, my parents went to a parent teacher conference. Like the teacher sent home a note and was like, you know, we need to have a parent teacher conference. Like there's some stuff I'd like to discuss with you. So my parents went to the t- parent teacher conference and this teacher went on to tell them, like, I needed to be pra- placed in resource classes because I could not think the way that other kids were thinking. And my parents are just like, what are you talking? Cause like, I was never a dumb kid. And it was just like, from a very young age, my parents knew I was an artistic person and that was going to be my biggest downfall. So there was an assignment of draw a horse in a barn. And so every kid drew like a pasture and they drew a barn and they drew a horse inside the barn and the sunshine. And they were like, you know, she's like, this is the assignment. She starts like handing my parents papers and they're looking at like, what does this have to do with anything? And then she's like, this is your son's and like lays this paper down and there's a window and a horse and like slats of a barn and straw on the ground. And my parents are like, what's the problem? And she's like, this isn't a horse in a barn. And they're like, how is this not a horse in a barn? Like, he just drew it from a different perspective than you wanted him to. And she's like, literally says to my parents, there is no place for kids that think like this in the world. And my dad went on a fucking tirade. (laughs) Like, he pretty much went to the principal and said, I am now going to pick handpick every single teacher that my son goes to. I'm going to interview them. I'm going to make sure they understand that he is not stupid just because he doesn't think the way that you think he should think. And like my parents have fought tooth and nail to help not just me, but like kids like through the generations now to feel empowered through art and feel empowered that they're not wrong because society says you need to think X, Y, and Z and you think DCL like, but I don't even remember what your question was. (laughs) It was, um, how do you hope to inspire others? (laughs) Oh yeah. I hope to be like my parents. I hope to like, just show people that like no matter how you view the world and how you think the world should be that's the way it should be like you know we all have our different ways of thinking and right now i think that's the scariest hardest part is that everybody is saying the way you interpret the world is wrong because this is the way you interpret the world and it's like You know, we can show people that the way they're interpreting the world, the way they've been raised is not fair and it's not equal, but it doesn't make them bad people. Like, they just might not understand or be able to look at the world in a big enough way that, you know, we just need to embrace them and be like, I'm sorry that this is the way it was, but you need to understand that this is not fair to these other people. You know, the world's a fucked up place and can't we all just hug each other and make it a little bit happier? I like hugs. I'm a hugger. Hugs are great. Yeah. I know you are, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hugger. I'm a, I'm a mother hugger. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get good hugs too. Thanks for telling me that story. That was, um, that's endearing. Yeah, my my parents are honestly like my greatest inspirations. Like my parents are, you know, everybody's like, I have the best parents in the world. Like I literally have the best parents in the world. Like objectively, my parents are some of the most amazing humans I have ever met. That's so cool. I love that. Um, I was going to relate to the crying that goes back to, is it Joe Briggs? I don't have Shudder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Dude, you love it. Joe Bob is the best. Yeah, he or yeah, Joe Bob. He um I remember one night when that first was airing or whatever, uh, I was very drunk <laughs> <laughs> off wine. And I finished watching a movie and Twitter was going crazy over what just happened, right? And somebody posted that last piece of him saying fuck aspiring. Yeah. And I just laid there in my bed at like one o'clock in the morning watching it. I just like 
I cried. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, oh, I've, like, I've, I've, I've watched it and cried like six times. Like it's one of those, like, I'm like, okay, if I ever like get an acting job for some bizarre reason, like that's a new trigger for me, but I cry fucking all the time. So there's nothing wrong with I'm crying. A crier. Everybody oh, no, no, needs it's a good cry, dude. It's funny because like Julie is so not, an emotional person and I am so just a hundred percent driven by my emotions. And so like, you know, the other day I'm reading a Batman comic and I am bawling and she's just like, what is so sad? And I'm like, it's not sad. It's beautiful. And it's like, <laughs> what is it? And I tell her, she's like, Oh, that's fine. I'm like, Oh, you just don't get it. <laughs> oh, the yin and the yang. <laughs> no, that's why we're so good together. Like I honestly could not, have made anything of my life to this point like in the film world without her she seems like a good support and she dude she makes great food by the way right she's so awesome being crafty um she makes you know that's that's another thing is like i know i know we're trying to wrap this up and i knew this would take us like 45 minutes but like you know that's if you can find people that love the thing you love and will support you like like a spouse like you know that's been the one thing like i said before like the only thing i miss about utah is my film people because you know i had this little group of people that were so dedicated and like i could call on a saturday and be like we have no money we have no time but we've got a camera and some lights so let's go shoot something tomorrow and they're like done what do you need we're there 100 percent like that's the hard part is like I started to crack that once I got here, but you know, once the COVID happened, like communicating and networking has become very not a thing. So, yeah. And I know, I know COVID's actually uh, stifled a lot of creativity with people, but it's because of like how much craziness is actually going on out there. And it kind of shows oh, yeah. that like, you know, creatives are, I, I, I kind of view creatives as being in touch with something, you know, like they're in tune with whatever's going on. And it's like right now, kind of like what you said, there's going to be a surge of great art after this is all over. But like for great art, you also have to be able to reflect, you know, and this mm-hmm. is a moment of reflection for sure. I just, I think it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. I mean, great, great artists are very empathic people. And I yeah. think that's both their, you know, quality that's good and bad because like <laughs> i love i love being able to like relate to a person or a character and be like i can feel your emotion i can feel why this is important and at the same time it's like i don't want to feel this at all yeah dude uh, i just i've uh i don't know i've been writing some dramas that have been like really self-reflective for me because like i moved i don't i don't know if you know this but i moved out into my own place mm-hmm. And so during that whole time, like there was like a lot of change. And so like, it was like real life world beats Chaz. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but being here alone now and being able to like do what I love and, you know, embrace that side of things. It's uh, offered a lot of moments uh, to reflect on like my childhood and like why things happen the way they happen. You know, it's like, those those kind of dramas kind of always intrigue me where it's more character driven than like plot, you know. So mm-hmm. I've been trying to write some stuff for that. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the beauty of writing is it's a form of self therapy. Like oh uh, yeah. You know, I mean that's always the best and worst thing about writing for me is I'll start writing stuff and and you know, I, I always feel like a, something is becoming really good when I've got this clear path, like the characters are going to go down this road and then they're going to turn right. And then like I start writing and all of a sudden they're going left and I'm like, where are you going? Like yep. that wasn't the play. <laughs> and you know, once the character to start taking off on its own, but it's always hard. Cause it's like, where is this coming from? Where in my brain is this tapping into that? I was not conscious of. And why is it tapping this way? Okay. Okay. Let's explore for a little bit. Yeah, and dude, that's the thing. So, like, I know a lot of writers, like screenwriters, and I guess authors too, will outline their whole movie, yeah, and do like a beat by beat, you know. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. It's good to have a solid plan and get an idea. 
like when the moment you do start riding, I'm like, there's so many moments when like, like you said, characters want to take a left instead of a right. Or like somebody doesn't want to show up that day, you know? And you're just like, right. okay, what's the, what is this? St-? And so really the story trying to become itself, you know? And like, then you have to make, make some changes to the outline and be like, it's like almost a math equation then, you know? For, and me, like, for me, I always try and like set out, like here are the big moments that are going to happen. Right. But then I'm never so adherent to it. I mean, hell, that that last script I sent you, Night Moves, that was literally, I wrote a, like, 70-page script. (laughs) And then I was like, well, it needs to be, like, a little longer, but there's no more story left. So then I was like, oh, what if I did this cold open that, like, kind of sets up the world and sets up a part of what's going to happen later down the line, but, like, isn't directly affected by the main story? And then I got done with the cold open, and I was like, well, now the cold open is 10 times better than the rest of the movie. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? And I'm like, how do I make it as good as this cold open? And then I just, I sat there for probably a week staring at it and just thinking and like every hour of the day was filled with just like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? How are you going to do this? And then I went, what if this isn't a cold open? What if like we follow this character and instead of having them die in the cold open, what if they survived? And like, let's see where this goes. And so I scrapped 70 pages and wrote this whole new thing. And now I'm like, this is probably the best screenplay I've ever written. Like, it's so much better. Do, do, you, do you have Twitter? Mm-hmm. Do you follow Cargill on there? I I don't just because i never use twitter but like i follow cargill like as a person <laughs> like he, so i'm very he, familiar with his work and yeah he he posts like i i always joke i'm like why has nobody made like cargillisms and like a right? daily calendar to motivate you because like his thing is like right every day no matter how shitty they are if you write one page mm-hmm. great you wrote mm-hmm. one page congratulate yourself you know and uh, he said, I think he said something like, even if you write 70 shit, shit pages or 60 shit pages, there's going to be like three or four or five good pages from that. That's going to be even greater. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's I, really, it's just like kind of uh, like peeling an onion, you know, like mm-hmm. re- revealing exactly where, where it is. I love it. Dude, I love being a creative. I hope you love being a creative. It's my favorite thing ever. I can't imagine not. Like, that's the thing, though, is like Julie and I being such polar opposites. Like, she literally loves math. Like, does expel spreadsheets for fun. Like, does math in her head. Like, loves math. Math is her favorite thing. She does not watch movies. She doesn't watch TV. She doesn't like movies. Like, and it's, people are just like, how do you two get along? And it's like, that's why we get along. It's because our interests don't like, conflict on top of each other. But, you know, I could never be a math person. I love being a creative and just putting things into the world that don't exist already. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm always like, if I, like, if I was not a creative, then I'd have like the standard, you know, nine to five job or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, then what? Like what I yeah. have to look forward to <laughs> for that, you know, and well, like, like every, every time I'm off of work, not working the nine to five job, like I'm always thinking like creatively, I'm like, got to do this, got to do that, you know, got to do this on this weekend, got to edit the podcast, got to like, you know, it's always something creative, but I'm like, yeah. if I wasn't creatively inclined, what the hell would I do with my life on my free time? Yeah. Well, you know, and that the kind of going back to the, like one thing that's like been inspiring for me, like, you know, moving, moving to LA was scary. Like going back into filmmaking, scary, like doing anything is scary. Putting scripts out into the world is scary. Like asking your friends to critique like cuts of movies is scary, but I have had like that. I can positively confirm like five near death experiences where I should realistically for all intensive purposes, not have survived whatsoever. And so like, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, you got to remember life is precious and it can be taken away literally in the blink of an eye. So like 
to me, it's, do I want to just do a nine to five job and be like, eventually I'm going to write the screenplay. Eventually I'm going to make the movie or do I just want to go, fuck it. I'm going to make it. If it's not great, I'm going to try again or I'm going to die trying. So that's a great mindset. Right. I try to remember it doesn't stay that way every day. Cause we all got to get paid. We all got to make money. We all got to like do what we got to do to survive. But you know, there's 24 usable hours in a day. And if I can use 16 of them to be creative and even if I'm working as a barista and like making a coffee, like sitting it like while the coffee's brewing, sitting there going, all right, the first scene, what's this character's motivation? Why are they going to walk through the door? Who is it, like, who in their past has made them feel this way about this situation? And how is that going to reflect on the end of the movie when they're finally changed? And Dude, you know? uh, I love it. I also love like when you're doing jobs and all of a sudden like, you get the epiphany, like the one puzzle piece that works. And you're like, I got to write this down. I have to write this down. <laughs> yeah. And, and then like, people are like, why? You're like, you don't understand. Just like, let me write down this like one word just <laughs> as a reminder, oh, yeah. you know? Like, oh, and that's, that's like, I'm so happy that phone notepads are a thing now because my <laughs> handwriting is awful. And I'd write things down and be like, I don't know what this says. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, Seinfeld maybe. when he wakes up in the middle of the night from a joke he wrote down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. But, um, okay. Well, thank you for coming on, dude. Well, thank you. This has been so much fun. I've, I I've very much enjoy it. I'm sure they will. I hope people enjoy it too. I I've, think, I've, I've been listening to every episode and been thoroughly entertained by everything and taken something out of every episode I've listened to. So that's good. That's what I've always hoped. You know, keep it up, man. Like I love that you're doing this. Like I've wanted to create like a podcast or a YouTube channel or something, but I created a, a little YouTube video and I'm like, well, this is absolute garbage. <laughs> I'm not like doing anything with it, but like you inspired me to be creative again. So thank you. Oh, thanks. I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know how to say about that. <laughs> um, no, I've, I've, I've actually been meaning to get you on for a while. So I, uh, yeah, well, I'm just glad. Are. I'm glad I did. And I'm glad my yeah. internet only shit out once. I know it hasn't been bad. Yeah. Not six times like justice. <laughs> I can't um, wait to hear that one. It's going to be so much fun. I, I, you know, I think during the rough edit, I think I did an okay job. Sweet. I think I just, he, he was, he was nice enough to backtrack a little bit. So, you know, like it wasn't like, I don't know. He could backtrack and I could cut like my own stuff and like splice yeah. it together. And I think it'll I'm work. Sure it'll be the video is going to be, be kind of jumpy, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Like people on YouTube, they love these jump cut videos. Like they drive me nuts personally, but <laughs> they're all the rage. So I'm sure, no one will care. Mm -hmm. um, okay, where can people find you? What do you have going on? Plug, plug yourself. <sighs> I mean, right now I'm stuck in my apartment ninety percent of the time, so <laughs> I'm not doing anything. But um, I have a YouTube. You can just search my name. That's the easiest. So. You, if you search for Taylor Deuce, you're going to get a bunch of Gilmore Girls because one of the characters' names was Taylor Dosey. And <laughs> so if you find, like, and it, it's funny because he was like an old man. And I'm like, this makes me feel better that when people Google me, they're going to find some old bearded dude and be like, <laughs> he said he was old. But yeah, if you just, it's, it's spelled like Moose or Goose, but with a D, like... I'm pretty easy to find if you just get past all the Gilmore girls. So, uh, Instagram, I don't Twitter, I Facebook occasionally. I'm more of a lurker. <laughs> Honestly, I need to get better about social media, but yeah, Instagram's my favorite. I'm on Facebook. I'll friend anybody, but if anybody wants to be my mentor that's been in the industry longer than I have, I've been looking for a mentor for years. A mentor. So anybody listening, if you want to be a mentor to our dear friend Taylor Deuce, fucking do it. Shia Buffett. Do and uh, it. do you have stuff out on Prime, like your tattoo documentary? Uh, I have the tattoo documentary. I have once this next documentary finishes its festival run, 
I'm going to put that up with that thing. has just been bonkers. You want one more story, Chaz? You want to make this a little longer? Hell yeah, dude. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So this, this documentary I made about a year and a half ago, probably ish. Time frame is not important. Year and a half ago, we'll say. Anyway, so my parents were in an art center down in St. George in Southern Utah, and they were featuring an artist that does large sculptures, like out of uh, found material. So it's like all this like complex welding. His name is Matt Clark. He is fucking incredible. But he does like anatomically correct horses out of discarded metals. Like he'll just like find like old junked cars or just like discard metal and create just these massive, massive, like, I think one piece they had there was like probably 16, 18 feet tall, like just huge. And the thing about Matt that is so inspiring is when Matt was 17, he got run over by a truck and like lost all the ability. He became essentially a quadriplegic and had no sense. They were like, you know, when he was in the hospital at 17, they went to his mother and they said, he's dead. Like he's never going to walk. He's never barely going to talk maybe. And the best that you really can do is to put him in a nursing home and let them just like use the next one or two years until he dies. And Matt was a rough and tumble, like cowboy country kid, like grew up on horses and stuff like this. And so like, to go from being a rancher and a cowboy to essentially being told, this is it. You probably won't even live another year, let alone ever be able to do anything. So Matt just said, fuck it. You can't tell me what I can't do. Let me tell you what I can't do. And so he just went out and literally like found a hammer and duct taped it to his arm and just started learning how to hammer and making his own tools and like forcing himself. And so now he's completely in a wheelchair. He has barely use of his hands. Like his hands are very twisted and can't, he has no fine motor skills or anything, but he makes these amazing art pieces. And so my parents asked me, they're like, Hey, if you and John are going to be in St. George, cause we were there for something else. And you're like, if you could just come and make a little promo, like a Facebook video about Matt Clark, that would be great. So we're like, yeah, like let's do it. So we met Matt and like went to his studio and did some stuff. And, and so we put together this little four minute Facebook promo reel. And I sent it to my parents and my parents were just like, this is amazing. And I'm like, it's yeah, it's not bad. Like it turned out pretty cool. And my parents were like, no, this is amazing. And I'm like, okay, like, thank you. You're my parents though. So like, I don't see it. Like, let's throw it up on Facebook. Next thing I know, I'm getting a call from the Doc Utah Film Festival because my dad like calls them and it's like, you need to take this movie. And I'm like, it's not, a, it's a Facebook post. Like, it's not a movie. So next thing you know, we get accepted into this, this big, like prestigious documentary festival in Southern Utah we end up winning the audience choice for short film, which was just mind bending because there were some incredible short films there. And it's now gotten into its ninth festival and like has won, I think four awards. And I'm just like, this was a Facebook post. This was not, this was not supposed to be anything. And it's been really hard for me because on the one hand, I'm like, this was never supposed to be a short film. It was never supposed to be accepted. It was never supposed to be what it's become. But I kind of took that step back again. And I was like, oh, no, this is just years and years and years of trying and failing and learning. And so now, like, this thing that you, we literally made it in six hours and we've met documentarians who are like, yeah, this was like four years of my life and years one over mine. And we're like, but we put in thousands of hours to get to this point. So, you know, I mean, it's cool. It's just, it's one of those things where again, to me, it's just don't give up because even if you don't immediately see 
where the good is coming and like all where the work is paying off. Like it's paying off. You just might not see it at that exact moment in time, but yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be on Amazon. soon. <laughs> Dude. Hell yeah. That's exciting, man. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff. Mostly my YouTube has most of my projects and, and Lilith is going to be done hopefully early next year is what it's looking like. So, so th- Real quick question on that. I don't know if you want me to yeah. ask off the mics. Here, we'll pause, and then we can cut it if we need to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll ask you that off the mics. Because, um, yeah, well, we're good. I'll ask you okay. after we're done recording. Um, dude, thank you so much for coming on, though. Seriously. Oh, thank you. And thank, thank you for you. sharing your so insight and your wisdom and for being a constant support. Of, Maybe if people are like, not get this guy off, I'll come back someday and like update you occasionally. <laughs> yeah, from LA. Dude, hope, dude, maybe I won't even be in the States anymore, like in Utah. I was going to so. say, like, hopefully soon you can come and visit and we can do an in-person podcast. Yes. That's the thing. I love the in-person podcast more than these. I mean, these are yeah. great. I mean, these, whatever. But like the in-person stuff, dude, like, to be able to like eye contact and like, High fives, even though that might be weird after COVID, but like <laughs> elbows will make elbowing a thing. I don't there know. You go. Winging it. <laughs> but um, okay, follow Deuce on the tubes of you, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I, mean, I have Twitter, but I, I literally get on Twitter like once a month and that's about it. So. What about letterbox? Do you have a letterbox? I do. I just, again, I never use it. Like social media and me like have that problem where it's like, if I'm on social media, I'm not working. So it's like, it's hard for me to like, like TikTok has been ruining my life lately because I am such a TikTok addict. Like (laughs) I posted all of one video, but I just have a hoot with TikTok. Uh, I found a, (laughs) I don't know. Oh, uh, that's just a random tangent. Oh, yeah. I, I relate. I'll just say I relate to being sidetracked easily. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and then follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Boom. Do it. So, Deuce, thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a great pleasure. And I hope you're staying safe there in the Los Angeles. Shit, man. Mass every day. <laughs> Fuck. (laughs) Okay. Bye, sir. Bye, buddy.